It's just the right thing to do. The cost of freedom I'm talking about today is the freedom that we must have in our lives in order to be right with God. And not only that, what's it, what it's going to cost us. Some people are shocked. I mentioned it in class today about Romans 6, 3 and 4 and the newness of life and how newness of life means a life that is completely new. And a lot of people come to Christ wanting to cling to the, uh, their old lifestyle. They don't want anything to change. I mean, let's not let any of the neighbors know we've changed. Let's not let our friends know. We certainly don't want to lose our friends. I mean, uh, they, they want to be a Christian as long as being a Christian isn't an imposition or isn't an attack on their own free will or their own life. As long as Christ doesn't become, you know, invasive of who I am and what I want to be and what I happen to be, uh, what I was before, then everything's going to be fine. The idea of freedom from the word ephesus in uh, the Greek means pardon. I found it interesting. Pardon, deliverance, forgiveness, liberty, remission. Acts 2.38, we're baptized into Christ. If you remember that, each, every one of us were to repent and be baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins. I love that because it denotes the idea of freedom from our sins. And I like that idea. When we're baptized into Christ, it's then and only then that we're set free from that burden of sin that we have. It's never we are redeemed, Ephesians 1 and verse 7, by the blood. But I find it interesting here that all of us understand there will always be those who want to take, away, uh, take us away from the relationship we have with God, the freedom we have with Almighty God. Now before we get into book, chapter, and verse... The first book that I ever wrote, that was ever published, that I did, was a book called Living Without Limits. Now, I'm bringing that up because it was a, a not a scriptural, I say scriptural, biblical book. It was a motivational book, if you will. Now, I still had biblical principle all through it. But my brother had a friend. And his friend is one of those that likes to pick things apart especially when it comes to Christianity or someone that he thinks might know a little more than he does. He wants to tear them down all the time. To which he told my brother, he said, I don't know how your brother could write a book and title it Living Without Limits. Isn't he a, a preacher and a, a Christian? And no one's more shackled on this earth than a Christian. How can he possibly say that he's living without limits? He's limited in the way he is, he's living. To which my brother asked me, he posed that question to me. And I said, no, you need to tell your friend that he's the one limited. Because he's limited to this world and what this world has. And it's the greatest he's ever going to see. I'm living without limits. Because my God says, one of these days, if I'm faithful and true to him, I'm going to see something like no one else has ever seen before. All those who are in Christ Jesus. It's a place called heaven. That's what I'm talking about, living without limits and having that way. But always going to be those type of people. I want you to watch this. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3 through 5. You want to turn there if you have your Bibles. If not, it's on half screen up here. For the time that is past, watch. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Now this is an interesting part of Scripture. Not that all of it isn't. But focus on what's being said here because Peter gets to the, to the nitty-gritty here. For the time that is past, that means your past life, suffices, that means that's good enough, for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Watch, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties. That's in the Bible, it's there. And lawless idolatry. Now look at verse 4 carefully. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery or dissipation, and they malign you. Now, before we get to verse 5, you look up and some scholars, some commentators are going to get, get right with the idea here of the, you know, the Greek language, what's being said, and it's very much to the point. There will be those people that will malign you, that will make fun of you. They're going to think it's strange that you don't follow the crowd. They're going to look at you. Some of you, you, know, you uh, g girls and, and boys that are you know, in your teenage years and, and they wonder why it is now. 
you know, why it is that you're holding on to purity and all of this, and they're going to make fun of you. They're going to look at you and say, boy, you are an oddball. Why are you holding on to purity? So much out here to explore, so much adventure for you to take hold of, and so much to be involved in, and here you are, living a life that's so limited because you're claiming to be a child of God. And don't you get tired of having your life governed by a book and by rules and all of this? Literally what's being said here, as one commentator said, is the imagery in the Greek of somebody running along with a pack of dogs or wild animals. They think that it's it's ludicrous for you to hold on to morality and not run with the wild pack of dogs through the neighborhood, not follow them. Never forget that girl. I know I've mentioned this, but that girl that talked to me and said, uh, I don't know what to do. She said, every time I'm around my friends, it's just a few years ago now, and the pressure was on her not to be pure. And the other girls were there and said, I want to tell you this, you know, I, I lost my purity at this age. I lost my purity at that age. Brother Jack, I didn't come here to hear all this. Well, you're going to hear it. You know, because it's Bible, it's true, and we need to share these things together. And she said, she said, you know, that the, they're talking about this, and the peer pressure's on, and I don't really know what to say to them. I don't want to be involved, but what would you say to them? And I think I gave her a good answer. I said, you look them in the eyes and you tell them, look, anytime I desire, I can become impure before God in doing exactly what you did. I can become exactly like you, but now you've stepped over the line and you can never be like me again. Never. That's the impurity issue. Out of that class, there were 73 women, 73 girls that graduated that year in that class. 22 of them had either become pregnant, were pregnant, or had abortions. And they're looking at her and wanting her to join in this pack. And she says, I'm not going to do it because freedom in Christ is more important to me than having, ha- having this, this relationship with you that's going to take me away from Almighty God. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Peter told us where we ought to stand as we face an ever-increasing world that is constantly wanting to change attitudes from what is biblically sound and moral. Now, church, the battleground is there. We've talked about it many times. And some people ask, well, now wait a minute. This is an old, tired, worn-out book. It's antiquated, meaning it's old. And we need to get into the 21st century here. Brother Jack, how dare you or any other preacher stand up and preach a morality of the first century? It just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit our customs today or what's popular today. And if I live my life the way you're saying about it, I wouldn't be popular at all. And you see, the bottom line is, God didn't call us to be popular with the world. He called us to be Christian, right? Now listen to what he says here. How long is this morality supposed to last? Now watch. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves, watch this, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Same way as what? As of Christ Jesus. Why? For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Now watch this carefully. The apostle Peter told told it like it was. Notice what he said. For the rest of the time in the flesh pretty much defines how long we are to cling to the morals contained in Scripture. As long as I live in the flesh here on this earth, I'm to be governed by the morals contained in Scripture. It can't get any plainer than that, church. Well, but I just think that this culture ideal and all that stuff Paul tells us that real freedom is in Christ and not following the crowds of the world or the latest fad. I mean, there are a lot of fads. I've seen everything, you know, excuse me, about the time I think I've seen everything, something else comes along. I mean, uh, I watching a documentary the other day about leopard man and lion man and lizard man. And I'm thinking to myself, 
In my humble opinion, why? I mean, I don't get it. This guy had actually had his tongue split, you know, had his teeth filed down to sharp points, had little knots put on top of his head. I mean to tell you, you know, little bumps and all these things tattooed all over himself. And I'm asking myself, why? Do you not know? I'm just going to I'm just going to lay this on the line. You can have all the tattoos and piercings and uh, body modifications that you want to have. And you're still going to be a man. You're not going to be a lizard. (laughs) You can crawl around all you want to. And I'm still going to say. You out of your mind. I mean, come on now. We get to these latest fads. Well, Brother Jack, I don't want to follow that. That's ridiculous. So is following a crowd when it's going to cost you your very soul. Isn't that right? Now we look and see, that's what we do. We like to differentiate and and separate and look over here and say, you know, I'd never be a lizard man. How could anybody be a lizard man? Amen. I wouldn't want to be a lizard man. I have enough problem with my looks, let alone trying to do all that stuff. But what about when it comes to the sin idea? I wonder, I wonder, if that lizard man, and I don't know anything about his religious identity, I don't know anything about it, I'm just going to give you a a picture here. All of us in here, I think, would not want to go through the body modification he went through to look like a lizard. Jack, get off the lizard, I'm going to in just a second. But what if that lizard man decided to repent and become a child of God? You think God would accept him? Amen. Amen. Now, all of a sudden, here we are. And here we are with in all of our supposed handsomeness or beauty, and we don't have the modifications and the tattoos and stuff, but we are stained with a sin problem, and we don't come to Christ Jesus. Who's better off? You see, we've got to get this this on right, church. You know, the, the idea that what really matters to us is we get to a point in our life we're willing to change our attitudes, our hearts, and our minds and simply say, I need to follow Jesus Christ regardless of my appearance, regardless of my gender. I need to surrender to that person. You know, who I'm supposed to be and what God would have to be. Watch this. Galatians 2 and verse 4. Paul says, yet because of false brothers secretly brought in. That's always bothered me. We're talking about freedom here, church. Yet because of false brothers, pseudo brothers, secretly brought in. Who brought them in? It doesn't say. Who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. He says, listen, there are some people that are so meticulous and they're wanting to be against God and biblical principle they will secretly bring someone in to preach and to teach what they want. I've heard about it and read about it here lately where uh, there are are what's known as the liberal element in the churches of Christ. And I read somewhere where I can't remember where it was, but where the, the people are really afraid now because they are trying to plant some people in different congregations to get congregation to change. I don't know this to be a fact. It's just a fear that someone has. If that were to take place, you know, what's going to happen here? Uh, obviously, in Galatians chapter 2, some of that happened to be going on. Paul told the church at Galatia, one of the big reasons Jesus died on the cross. You know what he said? Galatians 5 and verse 1, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. He said, let me tell you why Christ went to the cross. He went to the cross so you could have freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from, from the being in captivity by Satan. Freedom from being shackled down by sin. Freedom from that burden of the sin problem that's on you. Freedom from having to bear your burden alone. Freedom, being able to pray to Almighty God and have that that connection with the Holy Spirit can be there and the Holy Spirit can take those prayers and offer them up. Freedom, knowing we are God's children and being God's children, we are heirs of a promise. 
freedom, knowing that one of these days we'll relinquish all authority this world has over us. And one of these days, the tranquility of heaven and a place called home is going to be ours. It's called freedom. But church, in order to have that freedom, we have to give up something in our life. We have to sacrifice something to be right before God. It may be language. It may be a habit. It might be a friend. You know, who who knows? It may even be a job that you have to walk away from in order to be right with Almighty God and to enjoy all those freedoms. Somebody says, well, now, the Bible I have says that we're to be servants and we're to be slaves. We're to gird ourselves with towels and all of this. But you see, the idea of a bondservant is that we're not forced to do this. We do it by our own free will. I just... Love that. Get out of a yoke of slavery. Real freedom is being free from our sins through our obedience. That's what freedom is. I can't tell you how many times I've been at a baptism where someone, usually it's somebody a little older, that's baptized into Christ Jesus. And they come up out of that watery grave and you can still see the tears flowing. I baptize people and they come up and, and they're uncontrollably, you know, shaking because they're, they're so excited and that burden's been lifted from them. Now, it's not a, 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 a total emotional thing. I remember one guy that I baptized into Christ. He had been coming with his wife for over 50 years. 50 years. They've been married, I don't know, they were like 21 or so. He's just in his early 70s. Had been attending services with his wife. He was faithful. There every Lord's Day, he was there in that crowd listening. Never responded at all. Preaching a gospel meeting, I promise it wasn't anything I said. Because no power I have, it's the power of the Word of God, obviously. And all the influence of his wife and these good folks for all those years. He knew what he should have been doing. And at the end of that gospel meeting, this man comes forward and is baptized into Christ. Because they're moving to a place known as Not, K-N-O-T-T, Texas. And he moves away and I get word two weeks later that he was in a tractor accident and lost his life. But he came up out of that watery grave, tears flowing, the burden was taken off. He said, I should have done this, I know I should have done this. You know, the greatest thing in all the world is being a child of God. He said, so that so that my wife and I, I want to march through those pearly gates, he said, Revelation 21, 21, together with her. I love her so deeply. I always wanted to ask him, what took you so long? But I never did. Because it didn't really matter at that juncture. Because he was obedient to the cause and to the gospel call, 2 Thessalonians 2, 14. Real freedom is being able to submit to God out of true and honest love for the sacrifice He gave for the saving of our souls. You know what that means, church? That means do I have the ability in my own personal life to really not take God for granted and to really know what was done for me and to realize how important God realizes I am to Him? Now you think about that for a second. Sometimes we go through life wondering about our self-worth. Everything, you know, we want to put ourselves down. We can't do anything. You know, something happens, somebody compliment, whatever it happens to be, and we just feel like, like, you know, dirt on the bottom of a shoe. Do we understand you want your self-worth? Listen to what I'm saying today. I just don't know what I'm supposed to do. You're supposed to serve God. Your self-worth is in this. Jesus Christ died for you because you have a soul. All these people out here that you may deem as much more important than you are, Jesus Christ died for them for the very same reason and for no other reason than they have a soul that needs saving. And without His death, there would be no salvation. So our Lord and Savior died because we have importance to Him. We must always remember that, church. And the Lord's, you know, and the Lord's church we are important people I I didn't say to be haughty or boastful or proud I'm saying that Jesus Christ didn't die for junk right he didn't do that real freedom is in our serving one another let me show you what I mean by that Galatians 5 13 for you were called to freedom brothers only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh some people do that oh I'm set free in Jesus Christ 
You see, that's what's known as antinomianism. Big word. You know what antinomianism is? Yes, Brother Jack, I do. Antinomianism is people that believe and practice the idea that since you have been a child of God and since you are in Christ Jesus, therefore you're no longer amenable or no longer held to the moral law and you're free to do what you want to because you are a saved person. Now that's called antinomianism. And there are people that practice that. Um, um, I love what Thomas Huxley said. He said this, he said, A man's worst difficulties begin when he is able to do as he likes or do what he wants. How many of you young people couldn't wait till you got to be 18, 19, 20, some of you 40, 45, to get out of the house? Right? And there you are, 18, 20, 21 years of age, and you get out of the house because after all, you know more than mom and dad and you can't wait to do it. They can't wait for you to go. Well, you know what I'm talking about. So here you get out there and all of a sudden you find out after you're out there not too long, there's too much month at the end of the money. Listening to me? And it happens a lot. This is a real world. You mean I have to pay to live here? What do you mean? You mean uh, pay all these bills and all of this and, and all these things? And suddenly, living becomes, you know, you think to yourself, wow, here we go. And you see, nothing, nothing gets us into trouble than whenever we forget that even though we have freedom in Christ, we are still under law, Christ's law, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 21, and we still have to adhere to the Word of God that freedom in Christ does not mean freedom of morality, of freedom from obligation. Let's look at some other things here. John 8, 30 and 32. I'm going to go through some things hurriedly. I'm never going to get done. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word. Now notice that. Notice the condition. If you abide in my word and are truly my disciples. It's a double whammy. You've got to abide. You've got to truly be my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He said, before the knowing comes, the abiding has to be there. And if the abiding is there, you will be a true disciple. If you are a true disciple, then you're going to know the truth. And if you're a true disciple that knows the truth, that truth is going to set you free. Okay, let's look at something else here. I love this, and I'm just going to tell you this. Well, I'll, I'll read it. On the night of the emancipation of, of the Jamaica slaves in 1838, I read this and it gave me chills. On that night, those slaves got together and made a mahogany coffin. And they dug a grave. Because they had been enslaved for years and years and years. Into that coffin, they crowded all the various relics and remnants of their previous bondage and sorrow. In that coffin, they put the whips, the torture irons, the branding irons, the coarse frocks, the shirts, the great hat, fragments of the treadmill, and the handcuffs. They placed them in the coffin and screwed down the lid. And at the stroke of midnight, those Jamaican slaves lowered that casket into the grave and said, they said, we are free now. All these implementations, all these implements of slavery, we are free now. I love to preach John eleven forty four 44, wherever I go in a gospel meetings. I love to preach it because Jesus goes to the grave of Lazarus and he raises Lazarus from the dead and Lazarus goes forth. And if you remember John eleven forty four, 44, Jesus looks at the people and they say, unbind him and let him go. Lazarus raised from the dead like so many people raised in that water grave of baptism. But for some reason, they want to keep on the grave clothes. Just want to keep them on that attire that keeps them bound. They're not set free. Remember the illustration I've used many, many times about here we are where we sit in the proverbial bird cage and God has opened up that cage and here we sit in that bird cage and we sit on the same perch day after day and we whistle the same tune 
and we rock back and forth the same amount of times, and we eat the same food and drink the same water, and we're encased in this cage, even though God has slung this door open and simply said, get out of the grave clothes and understand your freedom. Now understand what I mean by that. I'm not talking about going hog wild out here. I'm not talking about losing morality. I'm talking about stepping out in faith and becoming greater in the Lord's kingdom than you've ever been before. God says, that's the freedom I'm giving you. The freedom I'm giving you is to grow in Christ and to grow in maturity. Well, one other thing I want to get to before we close today, maybe two things, maybe four or five. 2 Peter 2, 18 through 19. For speaking loud, boast of folly, they entice by sensual passions, Tell you what, I'm going to uh, close with this right here. Okay, sound room. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. Now notice what is being said here. The influence is there. Watch verse 19 carefully. They, those living in error, promise them freedom. But they themselves are slaves of corruption for whatever overcomes a person. To that he he or she is enslaved. Boy, I like that. You talk about something being spoken in confidence, something being spoken right down at the nitty gritty, something being said to us. He said, let me tell you this. You have those that are still involved with the idea of the flesh, those who are barely escaping, those who live in error, So you have uh, Christian people out here barely hanging on, people trying to give them the example, give them the nudge towards the world, trying to tell them this is where real freedom is. And we must understand this goes on on a daily basis. It can affect you too. And to understand that we need in our freedom, freedom is in saying yes to Christ, not no to Him. See, we have a, a wrong concept of what freedom really is. Oh, I know there are people out there that simply say, boy, I, I like the idea of freedom. I like, uh, can't wait to get on my own and to be free and to, to do what I want to do and live the way I want to live. I want to tell you something. Well, young people, I want you to listen to me because I know about that which I'm speaking. The time in my life, for the first 23 years of my life, The times in my life, amen, when I had the most difficulty, the times in my life when I was at the lowest I could possibly be, was never I was on my own trying to do things my own way and God was out of my life. And I found myself in trouble each and every time. And I did not have the power to pull myself up I didn't have the power. It's like learning to swim. I've told you about that. I asked my dad to teach me to swim. He picked me up and threw me in a lake. It's only about nine or ten feet deep. I didn't know how to swim, and the only thing I cared about then was guess what? what? What's the only thing I cared about? Breathing. My feet, I went down to the bottom. My feet hit the bottom. I pushed myself up, came up. Got a breath of air. I looked at my dad and I said, please do that again. No, I swam away from dad. You know how to swim yet, boy? You know the reality of it is. In that water, all I cared about was breathing. A lot of people in this world, they have it wrong because they think freedom's going out here and being part of the world. How much can I drink? How many lovers can I have? What can I do and get away with this? How can I experiment with this? And sad to say, in this world, in in this, this sea of the world, this ocean of the world, many people are thrown into that bad boy, and they have to go all the way down to their feet hit the bottom, and they finally realize the most important thing in their life is spiritual air. And sad to say, many people don't push themselves up off the bottom. They stay on the bottom deprived of that which can give them life. Thus the Bible talks in Ephesians 2 and other places about those who are spiritually dead. There's no life in them. Don't be that way. 
Understand real freedom is where life is. Real freedom is where rest is given, and that's in Christ Jesus. If you have a need today, baptism, repentance, whatever it might be, won't you come as we stand and sing?